it is a uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is my partner in crime, Dan Link, who is the professor of radiology and chief of IR at UC Davis. And Dan is going to give us a topic about Vena Kiva filters. Yeah, I already went over his slides, and they look great. So I'm pretty sure you guys will enjoy it. Thank you, everybody, and it's glad to be here. I um, <clears throat> do have some disclosures. I actually work uh, for a company that's developing a new Vena Kiva filter. And, um, I hope that won't creep in uh, but I, as a hidden agenda. I must say that I've probably put in between 1,000 and 2,000 filters and have looked personally back at over 1,000 uh, filter cases and I've re retrieved about 200 filters. So I have a good deal of experience. I've also been, I would say, paralyzed by nine years on the uh, investigational review board. <clears throat> so I know about outcome studies. I've reviewed a lot of data. Um, and so I'm going to start with standards. And the consensus agreement uh, from a joint uh, commission between the JVIR and the and surgery societies uh, for retrieving fa uh, filters, basically, if you have a, a retrievable or convertible filter, uh, the, the primary ther therapy is anticoagulation. Uh, the indications are similar for permanent filters. Um, when uh, anticoagulation is acceptable, uh, it, there are no absolute indications for filter removal. So <clears throat> if the risk of removal outweighs the benefits, uh, or if there's an ongoing risk, uh, or there, so if this is, this is just right out of the paper. <coughs> and then lastly, the literature is terribly flawed on this subject. So this is my experience in a thousand filters. Uh, most of the patients, either you can't find them or they're or they're dead, and and so we're left with a very small cohort. And out of a thousand filters that we reviewed in the 90s, um, surgery resident, I would say, tortured her for a year uh, trying to find these patients, and we we gave up. And uh, they're very difficult to find. And so the strategies uh, are gonna, uh, we're gonna be actually focusing uh, for this talk on these lower part. The people that they have a filter, they want it removed, uh, it's ordered or whatever, but they ca it can't be removed. Uh, there's too much thrombus, the patient's still at risk, floating clot, new DBT, or they have a coagulopathy. And um, so is retrievability really an advantage? We don't know, the, the data is flawed. So the, Driving this whole thing is this great fear of pulmonary embolism. And we're talking about not what you see here on the CT, but the sudden death of a patient that probably every clinician in this room, uh, including myself, uh, have had. Uh, that you get a call out of nowhere that a patient is just dead, and you go to the, if you're lucky enough these days, to go to the uh, coroners or the path lab and do an autopsy and you find that their pulmonary arteries are filled with clot. And so there's a big disconnect with the outcomes of a lot of the studies that talk about PE versus fatal PE that's actually quite rare, fortunately. So I did some figuring, I massaged the data. Actually, fatal PE is pretty rare. And what I said here, I put it in parentheses, 5%. If there was an incidence of 5% in a cohort of patients, you would have to do a randomized prospective trial of 312 patients, just using a power analysis to detect a 50% difference in that. Uh, in other words, if you wanted to do an intervention that re would reduce the rate to 2.5%, you would have to do a prospective randomized trial of 312 patients. There are hardly any trials, I'll get to that uh, at the end, uh, in the literature of that size for filters even though there's been a dramatic increase in filters. So when you have the endpoint of the sudden death, and you're gonna to have to decide, like one of my colleagues said, that putting a filter in or not is like having a parachute or not. I think it may be that putting a filter in or not may be much more like a pacifier. And so, or it may be in between. And so just we're, we're at a ski meeting. Uh, the other end, we all know that PE starts from Here's PE developed by ski boots. Hopefully you'll keep your ski boots loose today. <laughs> I deal with trauma patients. I've spent a long career dealing with the trauma surgeons in the middle of the night. Uh, 
PE is a problem. It's, it's really frightening to the trauma surgeons, and it comes out of nowhere. And in the 90s, we did this study, and we looked at when the deaths occurred after their trauma event. And this included patients who had uh, documented pulmonary angiogram evidence of PE, deaths with PE, and uh, positive VQ scans. And there does seem to be a trend, and as far as I know, this has only been repeated once. There does seem to be an alteration of risk. In other words, there's increase when, the, when patients come in with trauma. There's an increased risk for a while, and then by 15 days it goes away. So we, that's why I was interested, even in the 90s, and when I was jumped at the chance of getting uh, a optional or retrievable filter. And the FDA thinks that we should get them out, breaking news. So this is, I'm gonna build some cases for why I think the filters should come out. So here's a patient that I had, just had the classic Greenfield. There is no data on the new filters. This is like 10 years after a filter had produced. You can look at the forces and the distortion of this filter in the cava. In, in this case, he presented with a urinary tract in, infection and the struts were actually pushing in uh, to the kidney, causing uh, urinary obstruction. This is due to a lot of inflammation. Now here's a, another filter that you can see that's not, hasn't been in very long, and you can see there's tremendous forces pulling on these things that are not in these uh, mechanical design experiments or in the early things. So if you have a filter in for a really long time, remember, in, I have a lot of experience in trying to find these filters, uh, patients, they're either dead or they're out there somewhere, and Lord knows what's happening to them. So when a filter's in for a long time, there are stresses on the filter that can't be imagined. So what's published for the green field, since we have long-term data, right kidney, aorta, intestine, liver, everything, these struts have been wandering. Metal strut fracture has been reported with nearly every, every different device. And there's a substantial incidence of cable thrombosis. And this is variable. Uh, remember, all the data is flawed. This, was worst with the very first uh, filter, the Mobid Udin filter, which I happened to have, we did put in one and the cable, my N of one, Mobin Udin was clotted. I don't know if anybody even was here in this room is old enough to remember that filter, but that was the first Vena cable uh, filter. Um, so this is an interesting paper that I just, uh, was just last year, uh, a couple years ago, 121 patients, a fairly good sample. Remember, we need 300 patients, prospective randomized for any real valuable data, but it's interesting. These are long-term implants with anticoagulation. Substantial amount of new DVT, new PE, a uh, lot of cable occlusions. So this is what a, a, a large clot looks like. Uh, this is basically our experience and we're going to talk mostly about retrieval, uh, why, you, why they aren't re being removed. Well, we saw what the vena cava does when it gets, uh, causes the phenol. This vena cava reaction happens uh, in two different ways. One is that the cable struts cause the reaction. And the cable struts cause this reaction because of a lot of people don't understand that these filters move. We, we, the people that place them know, or people that have fluoroscoped the abdomen, notice that the filters rock back and forth with the liver. The right side goes down, the left side goes up with every breath. And that's why they tilt so much and they migrate. And this causes strut perforation. And you can see over in this, this one uh, where, the, where the contrast is that there's a strut uh, going out there and you can just actually picture that this is rocking back and forth. So this causes a uh, reaction of the cava, which you can actually see. You can actually see there's a big flat plaque there, a buildup of tissue. And it's that hard scar tissue that starts the, uh, as the struts get incorporated, it starts that mechanical uh, deformation of the uh, filter itself. The second way that, uh, that this happens is when the filter actually catches clot, whether it's in the struts, the wires, depends on the design, or on the side, it actually binds with this cable reaction and kind of embeds everything. And you'll actually, sometimes it embeds the hook. I should also say that the top of the filter, when it leans over, rubs against with this breath, and very often uh, will uh, 
attach itself to the cava there. That's a very common uh, thing. So adherence of the hook, strut penetration, uh, filling defect at the edge, uh, and here you can make the decision uh, not to remove it. And you can see here that, uh, that the cava is, uh, was kind of clotted. You know, I look at these, it's, it's not real, I find it fascinating. I look at every single case that we have that has a filter in it, and then a few months or years later, I'm looking back at every single imaging I could. In this particular case, you can see uh, that the cava was completely clotted uh, later. So here's a, a recovery filter. Strut fracture uh, is a common problem with every filter. And when the struts fracture, uh, and there's deformation, and it can be a problem. And so here's a, here's a filter, it's perfectly in position. The patient presented with chest pain. And one of the filter struts, uh, the filter actually uh, was mangled and one of the struts uh, migrated to the heart and it had to be removed. And this uh, filter is a problematic filter to remove when you have strut fractures. There's uh, one strut here that we could not remove. I had to remove everything else. But it was kind of a damaged filter. And there's some techniques I'd be happy to talk about. There's millions of techniques uh, to take out filters that are, uh, are damaged like this. This kind of migration has been fortunately rare, but is terribly dangerous. And this patient died from migration of the filter. So th this, and you can, try, it's hard to understand how this can happen. And I'm gonna uh, hopefully get to that. My friend Will Quo at Stanford is, uh, there are patients that want the filters out at all cost. You know, I think most of my, I know my partners uh, in interventional radiology, if they have a lot of trouble, they just give up. But there are patients that really want it out no matter what, and probably there are people in this room that can uh, know that. And there are various techniques, and this comes from a paper in 2008 by Dr. Quo, where he describes his techniques, you know, of taking out a severely tilted filter, and, and this is more of the paper, uh, long-term thrombotic complications. And finally, if you can't get it out, you can bypass it by stenting it out of the way. So I don't know how many people have, have this problem in the few patients that it's, there are some tricks. Um, one of the tricks is access from below. The first trick always is to upsize to the biggest sheath that you have, uh, the, the IJ access or whatever access you're using to take it out, will usually accommodate uh, a very, very large sheath. So it, I usually, use you know, 12, 16 French sheaths, something that's very large because you're gonna have a deformed matrix of metal coming out. And the first uh, case, foreign body I ever took out was a bullet. My friend, Dr. Holcroft, we, there was a bullet fo floating around in this paper that went from the liver to, to you know, the round of the heart. And so we actually, the, the snares just became available and we pulled this, uh, it looked like a 45 or something, you know, something that True Grit would use, but it was uh, probably, <laughs> probably only, it, but we pulled this, snared the bullet and pulled it out and this is like some of these filters. It was just a big thing we had to cut down on the, on the IJ and pull it out. But it was, that was spectacular. And some of these stent things when you remove them are spectacular. So you can use a big sheath and you can center, if it's really tilted, you can center it, put in a buddy wire from below. Uh, you can put a balloon in, in, inside the, uh, the cone if you have a cone type of filter and center it. This is a last technique. You get the thing centered and then you use the myocardial biopsy thing to actually pull it out and dissect it out. I showed this at a SIR meeting and uh, Bob Curlin, a good friend of mine, he said, yeah, we do that all the time. This is, I call that the plowed cava. So the, if you rip it out, and so, so far as I know, this patient didn't have any problems on that, which is amazing. So the FDA thinks that, that there's a risk of leaving the long-term filter. I showed you a lot of uh, reasons to get it out. Uh, this is the only randomized uh, study that's really available showing um, that uh, with filters in for a long time, there's a slight increase in deep vein thrombosis. Most of you are aware of this uh, DECUSA study. But there was also a long-term benefit for PE. But I remind you again that the only outcome that really is an advantage for having a filter would be if you decrease the risk of death. So we're, everybody is talking about reducing the risk of recurrent PE. Recurrent PE doesn't kill people very often. 
it's that sudden cataclysmic death endpoint that we're looking for, and it's just not in the literature. So there's a lot of interest and very few uh, studies that'll help us out. And so we might think of the filter as a parachute, but it may not be. It's not exactly like that. So this is a, what the, a kind of a pearl that I dug out out of hundreds. I think it's a pearl. I don't know, maybe other people won't. So this is a filter case uh, that, this filter, I call this a snowman in the cava. It's, the, the filter is completely incorporated in clot. So all of the filters, all, almost all filters we have, are, their attachment to the cava is predicated on a diameter of the cava versus how much outward pressure of the struts to attach it. Well, the cava is like one giant balloon. It depends on the pressure. It has, it's a very compliant structure. And so if you measure a cava of 23 millimeters, in certain situations, Valsalvas, whatever, that cava may actually go to 60 centimeters. And you can see in this cava is becoming enormous and the struts are completely incorporated in the clot. Not only that, we've done some calculations, and this may be a little bit of the bias, that that clot, when it retracts, we all know that clot retracts. As clot matures, we've just learned with all that fibrin and strandin, it retracts. We've actually calculated the clot retraction. It, it will definitely exceed all of the filter's abilities to outwardly push against the cava. And that's why we get the worst complication possible is the pu fatal pulmonary embolus from a vena cava filter the exact thing we're trying to prevent for filters and the only endpoint that we care about. And it's interesting enough, in most filter follow-ups, uh, this is a follow-up CT, the filter looks pristine a few months later. It's just sitting there. So all, all this clot was, uh, and we can argue that that's enough clot in the cava, and it did, in this case, it fortunately didn't uh, embolize the whole filter but it did completely resolve just sitting there. So in this case, it may have saved the patient's life, but no one would have known because the patient was asymptomatic. Uh, the follow-up uh, films showed a pristine filter and it was left in, so there was never any follow-up. So we have the advantage of, of uh, and I've been looking for these death endpoints. Uh, there has been an overall decline in death, point, uh, death endpoints from 79 to 98, and it may be we hope, the use of filters. So I think that they're very effective in capturing thrombus. You have red thrombus that can be lysed, and if you look very carefully at filters, you will actually see very small amounts of clot on the struts on a lot of filters that you pull out. And a lot of that, I've actually sent it for histology, is white clot. So I call that evidence for clot. So in our experience of 115 venograms that I've carefully studied, uh, if you add up the amount of big clot versus trace of clot, it comes up to about the incidence historically seen in patients who died in the hospital and had autopsies. It's historical, because we, we don't do that anymore. But 40% of patients used to die with PE in their lungs, and that's about what the capture rate is. Give or t in our experience, it's about 35%, with a confidence interval of about 13%. I think that's a pretty good indictment for the filter's work for catching clot. So the conclusions, we think that the filter efficacy, especially for the death rate, is limited and it's flawed. There's no large series with power to really make the endpoint that we care about. Uh, we need large data sets. I don't know if we'll ever get it. Uh, filters are not a parachute. Uh, but they may be a pacifier or they may be in between. There's just no data. Any questions? <laughs> Sir. Just curious, uh, on the filter that's incorporated in the thrombus that you left in the cave, would you put a filter above the filter to, for that while that's maturing? Or, because it, it, obviously you pointed out that that was a danger of, of uh, embolizing with the fibers. Uh, reaction around the filter and along. Uh, would you put a filter above that? 
I think if you knew about it, you, the person who read the CT might have clued us in, uh, and I'll, you know, I think they just read it as large cloth. Yeah, I think that the patient's at risk. Uh, the question comes in, and I think that the super renal vena cava may be a little bit stiffer and less compliant because it's intrahepatic, and so that you might have firmer connections. So as far as that embolic, uh, uh, you might, uh, there are other possibilities. You can do lysis of the clot uh, in situ, I think, yeah. And uh, so few, few options, uh, putting another filter in is one. Any other question for uh, Dr. Link? Well, thank you all for your attention. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is my partner in crime, Dan Link, who is the professor of radiology and chief of IR at UC Davis. And Dan is going to give us a topic about vena cava filters. Yeah, I already went over his slides, and they look great. So I'm pretty sure you guys will enjoy it. Thank you, everybody, and it's glad to be here. I um, <clears throat> do have some disclosures. I actually work uh, for a company that's developing a new vena cava filter. And um, I hope that won't creep in uh, but I, as a hidden agenda. I must say that I've probably put in between 1,000 and 2,000 filters and have looked personally back at over 1,000 uh, filter cases. And I've re retrieved about 200 filters. So I have a good deal of experience. I've also been, I would say, paralyzed by nine years on the uh, investigational review board. <clears throat> So I know about outcome studies. I've reviewed a lot of data. Um, and so I'm going to start with standards. And the consensus agreement uh, from a joint uh, commission between the JVIR and, the, and surgery societies uh, for retrieving fa uh, filters, basically, if you have a, a retrievable or convertible filter, uh, the, the primary ther therapy is anticoagulation. Uh, the indications are similar for permanent filters. Um, and when uh, anticoagulation is acceptable, uh, it, there are no absolute indications for filter removal. So <clears throat> if the risk of removal outweighs the benefits, uh, or if there's an ongoing risk, uh, or there, so if this is, this is just right out of the paper, moves uh, that's ordered or whatever, but they can't be removed. Uh, there's too much thrombus. The patient's still at risk, floating clot, new DVT, or they have a coagulopathy. And um, so is retrievability really an advantage? We don't know. The, the data is flawed. So the, driving this whole thing is this great fear of pulmonary embolism. And we're talking about not what you see here on the CT, but the sudden death of a patient that probably every clinician in this room, uh, including myself, uh, have had. Uh, that you get a call out of nowhere that a patient is just dead, and you go to the, if you're lucky enough these days to go. <coughs> and then lastly, the literature is terribly flawed on this subject. So this is my experience in a thousand filters. Uh, most of the patients, either you can't find them or they're, or they're dead. And, and so we're left with a very small cohort. And out of a thousand filters that we reviewed in the 90s, um, a surgery resident, I would say, tortured her for a year uh, trying to find these patients. And we, we gave up. And uh, they're very difficult to find. And so the strategies uh, are going to, uh, we're going to be actually focusing uh, for this talk on these lower part. The people that they have a filter, they want it removed.